Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the IPS Northern Lecture Series by Ravi Menon, our ninth SR Northern Fellow for the Study of Singapore. Today, Mr. Menon will be delivering his fourth and final lecture titled An Inspiring Nation. Following his lecture, Mr. Menon will take questions for the audience in the Q&A session. The Q&A session will be chaired by Ms. Tan Shushan, Group Head of Institutional Banking at DBS Bank. Before we begin, please allow me to go over some housekeeping rules for the event. The lecture is being streamed live on Facebook. It will also be recorded and uploaded onto the IPS website and our social media platforms later. Please submit your comments and questions at any time during the lecture during, through the Facebook comments. We will try our best to answer as many questions as we, as we can during the Q&A. We would also like to hear your views on the event. At the end of the lecture, there will be a QR code and a link in the Facebook comment box, which you can scan or click on to submit your feedback. So, without further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Ravi Menon to begin his final lecture, An Inspiring Nation. Mr. Menon, please. Good afternoon. Let me briefly take stock of the discussion so far uh, before I move on to the theme of this lecture, uh, An Inspiring Nation. The Four Horsemen, Demographics, Inequality, Technology, and Climate, will bring about profound economic and societal changes. To manage these tectonic shifts, seize the opportunities, and build a better future, we need to be much more of an innovative economy and an inclusive society. I've shared several ideas, taking care to also highlight the trade-offs and challenges in each of them. Make our domestic exports export, make our domestic services exportable. Digitalize our economy end to end. Green our economy. Attract global talent while growing the Singapore core. Study a minimum wage. Enhance workfare income supplements. Broaden progressive wages. Reclaim domestic services jobs for locals. Professionalize all jobs. Inculcate lifelong learning. And look after the least among us. And I made a special pitch for our migrant workers. I thank all those of you who have written to me with words of encouragement and support, as well as alternative views. Underpinning the specific ideas are three broad themes of innovation, inclusion, inspiration. The Singapore Synthesis is about how we can harness these themes in a mutually reinforcing way. At the heart of all innovation must be the desire for inclusion, to make people's lives better. To enhance inclusion, we need innovation in our thinking and mental models. And underpinning both innovation and inclusion must be a set of values and sense of purpose that gives us the inspiration to give our best, to overcome our obstacles, and to build a better Singapore. Innovation must become one of the defining features of Singapore, the way meritocracy, multiracialism, trust, and stability have become. Singapore is making its way up in the International Technology League tables. Just one example, in a survey of 800 tech leaders by KPMG, Singapore was the number one preferred technology hub outside Silicon Valley. I personally think the ranking is rather generous, but there's no question, Singapore is gaining mind share as one of the most digitally advanced countries in the world. Let us apply that same innovative spirit to make our education and healthcare services the Oxbridge and Mayo of Asia, and propel Singapore as the vanguard of a green revolution for a sustainable Asia. I believe we have the potential, but we are still far from realizing it. We need to raise our level of ambition. Innovation is ultimately about optimism and hope for the future. It requires a certain restlessness of the spirit, a sense of adventure, and a daring to take calculated risks. It is not about technology or rocket science. It is a passion for continuous improvement in everything we do. Inclusion, too, must become one of the attributes people think of first when they think of Singapore. 
True inclusion is more multifaceted than simple measures of inequality like the Gini coefficient. Speaking of which, I want to correct a mistake in the Gini coefficient number I cited for Singapore in my last lecture. Uh, the figure of 0 0.46 that I mentioned is before taking into account taxes and transfers. And I had compared that with other countries' Gini coefficients after taxes and transfers. The comparable number for Singapore, therefore, is 0 0.34 which is still higher than in many European countries and Canada, about the same as Australia, but contrary to what I said earlier, it is lower than in the US and UK. The printed version of my lecture will contain the revised paragraph. Focusing on the more important dimensions of inclusion, the picture is mixed. Singapore is doing well on median wages, not doing well at the level of the low-wage worker. Wealth gap is probably widening but may not be as bad as in many other advanced countries. Social mobility has been good so far, but could come under pressure in future. I want to emphasize real median wages because it is critical that the broad middle of society is doing well. Middle class stagnation is at the root of the social discontent and political polarization afflicting many advanced countries. I'm mentioning this number for the third time because I think it is so important real median wages in Singapore increased by an average of 2.6% per annum over 2011 to 2020. Partly because our broad middle has done well and not stagnated like in other countries, the gap between our 20th percentile and the median is higher than in other countries. Our low-wage workers are caught in low productivity, low labour cost, business models, mostly in domestic non-tradable services. Hence the focus in both my last lectures on uplifting the domestic services sectors. Although we are doing okay on social mobility, this is the area that bears closest attention. Our current generations are doing better than their parents because we were trans in transit from third world to first world. Going forward, it is going to be tougher. Our top priority for the social inclusion agenda must therefore be to ensure that every child from a low income or vulnerable family gets a good start in life. Now coming to inspiration, <clears throat> by which I mean the values and sense of purpose that guide us as a nation. Many of the issues we have discussed are not straightforward. They are laden with trade-offs and uncertainty. There is a risk to bear to become a more innovative economy. There is a price to pay to create a more inclusive society. Evidence-based analysis and a judicious weighing of options will take us some of the way in making those decisions. But ultimately, the choices boil down to what society values as important, who we are and what we stand for. An inspiring nation is one which is based on values and driven by purpose. There is a misperception that Singapore has been guided too strongly by economic perspectives at the expense of social and other considerations. Economics is not about dollars and cents. It is about scarcity and choice. Because resources are limited, we cannot have more of everything. We have to choose. This entails weighing costs and benefits and making trade-offs among competing ends, which is what most public policies are about. Some costs and benefits can be quantified, many others cannot be measured easily. But in making any decision, we are implicitly imputing a value to the benefits and costs of different options. Sound economic analysis helps us to be clear about these costs and benefits. Which particular option we choose depends on judgments. Economics cannot tell us what those judgments should be. They depend ultimately on our values. Values are different from value. As Mark Carney, former governor of the Bank of England, explains it in a recent lecture, and I quote, value is a regard that something is held to deserve, its importance, its worth, its usefulness. Value isn't necessarily constant, but rather specific to time and situation. Values represent principles or standards of behavior, judgments of what is important in life, such as fairness, responsibility, sustainability, solidarity, dynamism, resilience, and humility." Unquote. 
Focusing on values can help to clarify many of our tough choices. And we have discussed many such choices in the last two lectures. Beyond quantifiable costs and benefits, which are very important, the answer to the question of how far we should raise carbon taxes, for instance, depends at least in part on how importantly we regard as a core value doing our part as a global citizen in the effort to secure a sustainable future. Likewise, reducing the intake of low-wage foreign workers to reclaim jobs for Singaporeans will mean an increase in cost that the rest of society must shoulder. The cost-benefit analysis will provide the numbers, but it cannot provide the answer. That depends on values again. If you want to move towards a society where all jobs are done with professionalism and pride, then more important than the monetary value we place on the job are the values we hold about the dignity of all work. Focusing on values can inspire more socially altruistic behavior. Values appeal to our better instincts. They, in they inspire us to make more altruistic choices. Using monetary value as an incentive does have its usefulness, but does not bring out the best in us always. The American psychologist Barry Schwartz, who wrote the seminal book, The Paradox of Choice, tells the story of how Switzerland held a referendum many years ago on where to site its nuclear waste dumps. People in two cantons were asked whether they would accept a nuclear dump in their communities. Though people thought such dumps might be dangerous and might decrease property values, 50% of those who were asked said they would accept one. People felt their responsibility as Swiss citizens. But when people were then asked if they would accept a nuclear waste dump, if they were paid a substantial sum of money each year, a remarkable thing happened. Only about 25% of respondents agreed. The offer of cash effectively undermined the motive to be a good citizen. It ended up making a public interest decision one of self-interest. And a growing body of work in social psychology highlights the difference between intrinsic motivations and external ones. Intrinsic values, such as moral conviction or passion for the task at hand, inspires superior outcomes compared to external motivations, such as money or other tangible rewards. Excessive reliance on monetary incentives to promote good behavior will not have durable outcomes. An inspiring nation is one in which we appeal to the higher virtues and instincts in all of us. Focusing on values such as resilience, sustainability, and delayed gratification can promote long-term orientation and reduce short-termism. We tend to value the present much more than the future. Many people do not save enough for their retirement, not because they cannot afford to, but because they value present consumption more than future consumption. Is the preoccupation with the present the reason why societies are not doing enough to reduce their carbon emissions, even though we know that actions today will make less costly than those required in the future? Likewise, to promote innovation, we need to promote a value system that emphasizes constant questioning over an unthinking conformity. This must start from a young age, so that as children grow up, they can think in original ways. People are inspired when they focus on something larger than themselves. It could be the community around them, unborn future generations, their country, the environment, or the planet. Let us encourage and celebrate such other-centeredness. Our values should draw the best from across different traditions. Let us not fall into the trap that many countries have, where values are defined solely by ideology of political persuasions. As Senior Minister Dharman Chanmuragaknam puts it, the traditional strategies of both left and right in the advance to societies have lost their appeal. But we need more than ever the core values of the left, of social empathy, solidarity. We also need the core ethic of personal responsibility and effort that the conservatives have always espoused. These values are not at odds with each other. And that, I would add, is the essence of the Singapore synthesis, to imbibe a set of values that draws the best from multiple perspectives. 
So let me share my thoughts on five values-based attributes that could make Singapore an inspiring nation to Singaporeans as well as others. One, a meritocracy of hope. Two, a beacon for diversity. Three, a city of giving. Four, a heart for the environment. And five, a thousand points of light. Let me begin with a meritocracy of hope. There are three vital institutions that have underpinned the growth of countries that today we regard as developed. Democracy, meritocracy, and the market economy. They have also been keen success factors for Singapore's own development as a nation, a society, and as an economy. Underlying democracy, meritocracy, and the market is a set of common values, freedom, fairness, equality, excellence, to name a few. These values have helped to shape the ethos, the policies, and social compact in many of these countries. Today, all three institutions are under pressure in many parts of the advanced world. In many countries, democracy is not working as well as it used to, with gridlock in government, growing polarization of views, and an excessive focus on rights without due regard to responsibilities. Meritocracy is coming under growing criticism as being stacked in favor of those already at the top and failing to deliver the equality of opportunity that is one of its central premises. Likewise, many people are questioning whether the market economy is indeed delivering the optimal outcomes that its proponents claim. Unfettered markets are seen as having contributed to financial crisis, monopolistic practices, and grossly unequal outcomes. There is something about democracy, meritocracy, and the market that if left completely unfettered, they lead to excesses that are socially harmful. At least for the market economy, this is probably what Karl Marx had in mind when he predicted that capitalism contains within itself the seeds of his own destruction. But there is no better alternative to, to democracy, meritocracy, and the market. As Winston Churchill once said, democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the others. The same could be said of the market economy and meritocracy. What we need is to continually refine, temper, and even constrain to some extent democracy, meritocracy, and the market, so that we can continue to harness their benefits while minimizing their excesses. Marx's prediction did not come true because capitalism continually reinvented itself or rather governments intervened in many ways over the last 200 years to make markets work. Likewise, meritocracy is at risk of becoming rigid or hereditary if growing inequality of outcomes leads to a growing inequality of opportunities. This is not the fault of meritocracy per se, but the outcome of very natural human instincts, namely what the Irish author Lucinda Riley calls the most powerful force on earth, which is the love of a parent for a child. As I mentioned in my first lecture, people are naturally good at passing on their privileges to their children. But when the elite reproduce themselves, we are at risk of a hereditary meritocracy. To use Marx's analogy, meritocracy carried to an extreme undermines itself and sows the seeds of his own destruction. So every now and then, meritocracy needs to be saved from itself. Now, it is not easy for public policies alone to do this. After all, policy is then up against the most powerful force on earth. We need a whole of society effort to fine tune our meritocracy. And again, it comes down to values. Can we have a more enlightened meritocracy? A meritocracy that offers hope. Our meritocracy has worked reasonably well. But the risks of an increasingly narrow and rigid meritocracy are real. Can we redefine and enhance our meritocracy so that it remains an expander of opportunity, not a restrictor of opportunity? Let me highlight three ways how we might do this. One, a broad meritocracy to recognize a more diverse set of human talents and skills. Two, an inclusive meritocracy 
to blunt some of the sharp edges of meritocracy. And three, a compassionate meritocracy, to recognize the role that society and fortune play in the success of individuals. First, a broad meritocracy. Isaac Asimov, the famous science fiction writer and professor of biochemistry, has an IQ of 160. That puts him well into the genius range. In an endearing passage in his autobiography, Asimov says, and I quote, suppose my auto repairman devised questions for an intelligence test, or suppose a carpenter did, or a farmer, or indeed almost anyone but an academician. But every one of those tests, I'd prove myself a moron. In a, where, in a world where I could not use my academic training and my verbal talents, but had to do something intricate or hard, working with my hands, I would do purely, poorly. My intelligence then is not absolute, but is a function of the society I live in and what it values highly. The recognition that we must broaden our definitions of merit and recognize excellence in different areas has been growing in Singapore. There is now much greater flexibility in our education and training system to take into account different individuals, different areas of strength. Some of us are very good with numbers, not so good at words. Uh, some the other way around. A, a streaming system that conflates scores across different sets of ability was not the most effective way to bring out the best in our young. The Ministry of Education has undertaken a major shift in this direction with the implementation of full subject-based banding in secondary school. Students will have the opportunity to take subjects at a higher or lower level based on their strengths. It will stretch their potential in subjects that they are strong in, while giving them more time and space to develop in areas that they need more help with. This is what broad meritocracy looks like. Broad meritocracy must extend beyond schools to the workplace. It is little point to have a school system that recognizes different areas of strength, but the workplace does not reward them equitably. So at the risk of sounding like a broken record, let me say this again. Let us give greater recognition and reward to a broader range of skills and attributes in the jobs market. But more important for the success of a broad meritocracy are the values that we subscribe to as a society, that every skill is rec recognized, every job has dignity. On that note, let me make a small point. When we speak of alternative peaks of excellence, um, as a, alternatives to academic excellence, we often speak of arts, music, sports, and so on. We need to go beyond that. Uh, in fact, talent in the arts and music are even more rare than in academics. They are really gifts. Not many of us have it. The same is probably true of sports to some extent. We need to recognize excellence in more diverse fields. The warmth and care of a nurse, the empathy of a social worker, the creativity of a designer, the workmanship of a carpenter, the culinary skills of a chef, and so on. Broadening our meritocracy should not mean a slide into mediocrity. Excellence must continue to be the hallmark of our meritocratic society. We just need to recognize and celebrate that excellence in more and more areas of work. Second, an inclusive meritocracy. Our meritocracy has over the years become rather sharply defined, especially in our schools. There's been too much anxiety over single-digit differences in scores at the primary school leaving examination. Now, making too fine a distinction in test scores is not necessarily reflective of actual differences in ability and caliber. So the Ministry of Education is moving away from fine differentiations in PSLE scoring. This will lead to more mixing across abilities and backgrounds in our schools, which is consistent with a more inclusive meritocracy. Of course, we cannot totally ignore exam scores in allocating places in secondary schools. But there are benefits to having more diversity and ways could be explored to strike the right balance. Again, an inclusive meritocracy cannot stop at our schools, but must extend to the workplace. Life trajectories should not be overly determined by grades earned in schools. In many of our companies, 
there is still too much emphasis during recruitment on educational qualifications and interviews, which tend to favor particular skill sets and attributes over others, and may not be what the employer really wants. I've been told quite often that a six-month internship on the job tells far more about a candidate's suitability and likely to do well than analyzing resumes and conducting endless interviews. Internships also give those who may have missed getting top grades the opportunity to demonstrate on the job their capabilities and strengths. Third, a compassionate meritocracy. The role that both society and luck play in the success of individuals is often underestimated. Ben Benenke, former chairman of the US Federal Reserve System, puts it quite dramatically, and I quote, a meritocracy is a system in which the people who are the luckiest in their health and genetic endowment, luckiest in terms of family support, encouragement, and probably income, luckiest in their educational and career opportunities, and luckiest in so many other ways difficult to enumerate. These are the folks who reap the largest rewards. The only way for even a putative meritocracy to hope to pass ethical muster to be considered fair if those who are the luckiest in all those respects also have the greatest responsibility to work hard, to contribute to the betterment of the world, and to share their luck with others. Benenke's depiction of the centrality of luck in a meritocracy reflects the US situation, I think, more than Singapore's. Yet there is some truth in what he says. Some of us in Singapore believe that the success we have achieved is through our ability and our effort. And while this is indeed true in good measure in Singapore, we often forget that it also took a village and a fair amount of luck in helping us get where we are. If we take our meritocracy too literally, we could fall into the trap of an entitlement mentality. I worked hard, I deserve what I have, and I don't owe anything to those who did not put in as much effort. Let us not forget how much help we have gotten from others, how much fortune has favoured us on our life journey. That should give us a lot more humility to feel less entitled, more grateful and more compassionate to those who had less fortune. Next, Singapore is a beacon for diversity. Many societies are struggling with diversity, differences in socioeconomic status and opportunity, in values and culture, in political affiliations, in, in ethnicity and religion. The voices of balance and reason have become quieter. The voices of anger and resentment have become louder. The Irish poet William Butler Yeats wrote these words 100 years ago, and I quote, Things fall apart, the centre cannot hold. The best lack all conviction, the worst are full of passionate intensity. Singapore too is seeing greater diversity across multiple fronts, nationality, ethnicity, cultural values, political views, belief systems. Diversity that is not managed well has fractured societies. Like technology, diversity is double-edged. It can be either a force for good or bad, depending on how we manage it and harness its energy. Again, it comes down to values rather than policies. Values like keeping an open mind, developing empathy, and being gracious. First, keeping an open mind to different views. We must develop a greater commitment to evidence-based analysis and the courage to change our mind when confronted with contrary evidence. To quote George Bernard Shaw, progress is impossible without change, and those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. It helps if we can hold our convictions a bit more lightly, continually seek truth from facts, and make a special effort to look for evidence that challenges our own hypothesis and beliefs. It is hard to have meaningful discussion if you're not open to the possibility of changing our views. Well, if you're not open to that, then at least let us be open to learning from the other side. 
This is especially important in the world of social media, which often acts as an echo chamber of our own views. As a society, we must master the art of respectful disagreement. We need to establish good norms, common vocabulary and trusted platforms for constructive discourse to navigate differences in views and build common ground. Understanding that there are benefits and costs arising from almost any cause of action sensitizes us to the complexity of many issues and the necessity to find middle ground. For Singapore to become a beacon of diversity, we need to develop a strong capability for healthy civil discourse. Where we accept people have different points of view and preferences, but we respect one another, think through our differences, and try to find compromises. Second, developing empathy to understand how the other party feels. Each of us has our own story, our views, values, and emotions. They're all shaped by our life experiences. As former US President Barack Obama said in one of his speeches, I think we should talk more about our empathy deficit, the ability to put ourselves in someone else's shoes, to see the world through the eyes of those who are different from us." Unquote. The reason behind many disagreements is that lived reality is not in accord with statistical facts. Take, for instance, the frequently expressed concerns about job security or discriminatory hiring. Yet, during the first quarter of this year, net jobs for locals increased by 24,000, and there were 68,000 vacancies remaining at the end of the quarter, with many businesses complaining they're short of staff. But for those who have lost jobs, or know of friends who have lost jobs, or seen a less qualified foreigner being employed in place of a local, that is their lived reality and is at variance from the statistical facts. While these cases do not represent the totality of the situation, they are very real for those who are adversely affected. And there were 95,000 unemployed residents at the end of the first quarter. Yet it does not change the larger reality that Singapore is a labour short economy, facing acute skills shortages that we've had to rely on well-qualified foreigners to fill. This is where empathy comes in. We should not reject statistical facts just because our own real lived reality is at variance with them. But nor should we trivialize anyone's lived reality as a mere exception to the statistical facts because the pain for him or her is real. There is some discriminatory hiring. Let us stamp it out. There have been fake certificates presented by some employment pass holders. Let us send them back home. But let us not overgeneralize. Let us also acknowledge that many foreigners who have come here to work are highly qualified, passionate about their work, and decent people. They work hard, keep late nights, deliver good products and services, and contribute to our society. One of my favorite poems I read as a child is entitled The Blind Men and the Elephant by John Godfrey Sakes. It starts like this. It was six men of Hindustan, to learning much inclined, who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each by observation might satisfy his mind. I'll not read the whole poem, but many of you would know how it goes. The one who touched the elephant's side thought the elephant was like a wall. The one who touched the tusk thought the elephant was like a spear. The one who touched the trunk thought the elephant was like a snake. And it goes on. The last verse of the poem is instructive. And so these, wise, so these men of Hindustan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly right, and all on, but all were in the wrong. In many of our public discourses, we are like the blind men of Hindustan, holding on firmly to our own narrow perspective of the truth and missing the larger picture. But if we could share and aggregate our limited perspectives, we can form a clearer picture and a better understanding. Third, being gracious. Lim Siong Guan, former head of the civil service, 
and the fourth SR Nadan fellow spoke of a gracious society in his lecture and recounts how so many Singaporeans that he polled listed a gracious society as one of their top wishes for Singapore. This augurs very well for constructive, respectful debate. Unfortunately, social media has not been helpful in this regard and has encouraged bitterness. We could do with less labelling and personal attacks. Let us not label those who are open to welcoming foreigners into Singapore as uncaring or unpatriotic. Likewise, let us not label those who are unhappy with the influx of foreigners as racist or xenophobic. Let us not pounce on every mistake people or the government makes. Everyone slips once in a while. Let us be charitable and forgiving. Let us be temperate in our language, respectful in our disagreement, well-meaning in our criticism. And let us also take criticism in good spirit, without offence. If Singapore can successfully harness its growing diversity as a source of creativity and vibrancy within a culture of tolerance and respect for differences, we can stand out as a shining beacon for diversity in a fractious world. Can Singapore be a city of giving, a nation of volunteerism and philanthropy, serving our own community and Asia? Giving one's best for others, from simple acts of volunteering to being a centre for philanthropy, is yet another marker for an inspiring nation. Singaporeans are becoming a more generous people. According to a 2016 report by the UK-based Charities Aid Foundation, Singapore is sixth out of 24 countries based on percentage of GDP donated by individuals to non-profit organisations. That's not bad. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought out more of the volunteering spirit among many Singaporeans. In the latest financial year, the National Volunteer and Philanthropy Centre, NVPC, set a new record of $102 million in donations to about 600 charities on Giving.SG, its one-stop platform to donate to local charities. This was more than two and a half times the money that was raised in the previous financial year. The number of volunteer sign-ups through the platform also increased significantly from 28,200 people in, 19, in 2019 to about 32,300 in 2020. But it is the human stories of giving that are even more inspiring than the numbers. And there have been so many such stories during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic last year. Two young hawkers who run a stall at Hong Lim Food Centre started an initiative to serve food to anyone who is unable to afford meals. No questions asked. With a touch of humour, they named this the Bing Who Cares Foundation. Together with 14 of her friends, 27-year-old Noor Fateha created SG Healthcare Heroes to gather messages of appreciation through Instagram for our healthcare workers at the front line fighting the pandemic. Two 18-year-old students started Com Unity SG. At the very beginning of the pandemic, a ground-up youth initiative committed to serving the homeless and displaced individuals. And before the government began its mask distribution exercise, 16-year-old Beatrice Wong sold over 300 masks and distributed them to those in need. Then there is the COVID Migrant Support Coalition, which organised relaxation workshops, games, help desks and so on to help with our migrant workers' mental well-being and mindfulness during the pandemic. Each of these small acts tell a story of inspiring kindness. The initiatives may not mean much in the grand scheme of things, but they are priceless for what they say about a mindset of other-centeredness and the value of caring. Can Singapore serve as a, sub, as a hub for philanthropic giving, both here and in the region? Singapore is one of the largest offshore wealth management centres in the world. There are more than 400 single-family offices here. According to UBS Bank, 70% of family offices are engaged in philanthropy. We can be even more purposeful as a financial centre if this wealth can be deployed to advance development, innovation, inclusion and sustainability in Asia. There is growing interest in philanthropy and environmental sustainability among the rich of Asia. 
we can combine charitable minds, deployable capital, and our trust premium to serve as a credible and impactful base for philanthropists to do good work in the region out of Singapore. Being a philanthropy hub will encourage the development of philanthropic advisory capabilities and again, good jobs for Singaporeans. We can combine innovation with inspiration by applying innovative methods to enhance philanthropy. Donors have moved away from direct giving to exploring the use of innovative structures with the aim of delivering the greatest impact in a sustainable manner. Modern approaches to philanthropy include setting up donor-advised funds and contributing through third-party foundations. There are venture philanthropists who adopt a venture capital model, playing an active role in guiding the future of the beneficiaries, providing early stage financing, and very importantly, mentoring their leaders. Human compassion is not bound by national borders. We are inspired and proud to be Singaporeans when we see Republic of Singapore Air Force planes take off, bearing relief supplies to help countries in our region hit by natural disasters. Less than 48 hours after the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami hit the coast of Sumatra, the Singapore Armed Forces activated its largest humanitarian assistance in disaster relief operation. It involved the deployment of more than 1,500 SAF personnel, three supply ships, 12 helicopters, and eight transport and utility aircrafts that carried relief supplies and helped to treat more than 5,000 patients. And just two months ago, Singapore sent two plane loads of oxygen cylinders to India, which was facing an acute shortage of oxygen arising from a second wave of COVID-19 infections. It's not just the government. What's more inspiring is the charitable spirit of Singaporeans. In the aftermath of the 2008 Sichuan earthquake in China, the Singapore Red Cross, our SRC, donated $2 million worth of medical equipment to support hospitals in the region. This made a lasting impact five years later when another earthquake struck Sichuan in 2013 and these hospitals relied on the same donated equipment. Last year, Singapore Red Cross reported donations amounting to more than $6 million for COVID-19 relief operations in China, which were received from various stakeholders, the general public, corporations and the government. Just this month, the Singapore Red Cross reported receiving over $7.5 million in donations from members of the public and organisations for its humanitarian response at India's time of need, helping to fund ventilators, masks and other supplies for affected com communities. Our millennial, millennial generation may well set new norms for giving. They already make up about one out of five Singaporeans they will play a more prominent role in society, better educated and more exposed to the different parts of the world than earlier generations. They have a deeper insight into the struggles and suffering that exist in other parts of the world. They may well have a more expansive vision and non-material priorities in life. And that is good, that is inspiring. More broadly, there is a growing level of social consciousness among the young. There is greater interest in issues of social development. We see more charitable donations, ethical purchasing, and more socially conscious consumption. Some of them are perhaps fads or fashion statements, but I also believe that some of this reflects a deeper meaning of life dimension. Volunteering and social enterprises in particular have been growing throughout the last decade. The COVID-19 crisis has vividly shown just how important the value of caring is. The American professor of psychology, Alison Gopnik, makes an important point. Care expands an individual agent's utilities to include the utilities and goals of another. This kind of expansion of the self serves the same overall function as the social contract. It lets a community of people do better than any individual could. Or as Lord Baden-Powell, founder of the Scouting Movement, said it more simply in his last message to the Scouts of the world, the real way to happiness is by giving happiness to others. Singaporeans can aspire to that ideal for ourselves and for our neighbours as a city of giving. People across the world and in Singapore 
are increasingly concerned about climate change and environmental degradation, and they want to do something about it. Climate change is becoming a powerful rallying cry to inspire people to step up to a higher cause, to take collective action for the common good of our planet. Climate change could be the burning platform to, Singap to make Singaporeans an environmentally conscious people with a heart for nature. There is probably no other area in the national agenda like climate change that combines the imperative to manage the existential risk posed by climate change with the opportunity to seize the growth engine of the future, a green economy, with the inspiration to rally people to take action for a larger good. Singaporeans are indeed becoming more environmentally conscious. According to a 2020 study by the Institute of Policy Studies, 61% of Singaporeans surveyed felt that protecting the environment should be prioritized even if it results in slower economic growth and some loss of jobs. This is a jump from the proportion who felt this way in previous studies in 2002 and 2012. The survey also showed higher public awareness of climate change and its impact. More than 9 out of 10 people support Singapore making a shift to a low-carbon economy. More individuals are taking climate-friendly actions. Most of them are motivated to preserve a livable world for future generations. Respondents believe that individuals, business, community groups and the government all have a part to play in tackling climate change. There's a range of deep values that underpin people's commitment to the environment, the same values that are congruent to a cohesive society. Some see intrinsic value in nature. Some see nature as a way to connect with people, to work for a larger cause. Some believe that caring for ecosystems is crucial to caring for fellow human beings, present and future. Some see caring for the environment as personal fulfillment, others as a social responsibility, yet others as a moral necessity. All of these are inspiring values because they're all about something larger than ourselves. What will take us to the next level is for groups of like-minded people to commit to collective actions to safeguard the environment. Let us not wait for the government to organize. There are so many things we can do as individuals, as groups, and as companies. I have not done this myself, but a good way to start would be to calculate your own carbon footprint. I understand SP Group has launched a personal carbon footprint calculator. I also know from my involvement with the Emerging Stronger Task Force Alliance for Action on Sustainability of discussions to explore sophisticated carbon footprint trackers that even go into the supply chains of what we consume. There is much more that we can do to minimize our negative impact on the environment. We can do an energy audit of our homes to identify ways to be more energy efficient. We can change incandescent light bulbs to LED lights. We can stop buying bottled water, reduce single-use plastic. We can make a conscious effort to reduce waste. We can become a zero-waste nation and a circular economy where we use less resources and recycle resources. We have done it with water. Singapore is the first country in the world to achieve circularity in the water sector. We collect every drop of used water, treat and purify it, and turn much of it into clean water again. We can extend the circularity principle to other areas. We can reduce food waste and plastic waste. Under the Zero Waste Manpower, Zero Waste Master Plan, by 2030, Singapore aims to reduce by 30% the amount of waste per capita that we send to our landfills. That can only be achieved through collective action of all Singaporeans. We can eat lower in the food chain. Researchers at the University of Oxford have found that cutting meat and dairy products from our diet can help to reduce one's carbon footprint from food by up to 73%. Perhaps we could consider cutting out meat for one day a week, taking a leave from the Meatless Monday movement in the US. Of course, we should take care not to gorge up on meat on Tuesdays to make up for the deficit on Monday. We can drive less and take public transport more. I must acknowledge this is something I've not been able to do myself. But this is indeed a needle-moving change that we could strive for. According to the National Climate Change Secretariat, 
private cars make up the largest share of emissions by the transport sector in Singapore. A 2021 study of seven European cities found that individuals who switched one trip per day from driving to cycling reduced their carbon footprint by about 0.5 tonnes over a year. Initiatives like car-free Sundays have been trialled in Singapore and they give us a glimpse of what a car like Singapore could look like. Former US President George Herbert Walker Bush said at his inaugural address, I have spoken of a thousand points of light, of all the community organizations that are spread like stars throughout the nation doing good. Singapore too must have a thousand points of light. We depend too much on the government to solve our problems. Good government is Singapore's greatest strength. It is also our greatest vulnerability because it is a single point of failure. To some extent, we do not have much latitude. For a small, young country, good government is critical. We don't have the ballast that larger countries with long histories and deep traditions have to survive bad government. But we can try to reduce the concentration risk. Moreover, with all the complexities and challenges ahead, Singapore needs a much stronger ecosystem, multiple sources of strength, a more active citizenry that self-organizes, a strong business community that takes the lead in innovation and ideas to grow the economy, an energetic civil society that champions change for the betterment of the country, a vibrant academic community that provides rigorous independent analysis and insights, a high-quality media that informs and promotes public discourse based on fact and reason. A purposeful and professional philanthropic community that makes impact on the ground. And so on, making up a thousand points of light, brightening and energizing our nation. With the growing fractures in many societies, an engaged and caring citizen, citizenry is more relevant than ever. Martin Wolf of the Financial Times puts it very well. In today's world, citizenship needs to have three aspects. Loyalty to democratic, political and legal institutions and the values of open debate and mutual tolerance that underpin them. Two, concern for the ability of all fellow citizens to lead a fulfilled life. And three, the wish to create an economy that allows the citizens and their institutions to flourish. We must become a democracy of deeds, not just words. We associate democracy with debates in parliament and political rallies during elections. And today we have a vibrant social media scene. These are no doubt important, but they're not enough. In 1971, S. Rajaratnam, one of Singapore's founding fathers, spoke of a democracy of deeds, a democracy based on public-spirited action to solve society's problems. He explains that a real democracy is, and I quote, one in which the various activities in a society are distributed as widely as possible among the people. Building an innovative economy and an inclusive society is a collective national effort. The government has made major moves over the years to expand social safety nets and promote opportunities for all. Maybe it can do more, maybe it can do less. But the government alone cannot create an innovative economy or an inclusive society. That must be a collective national endeavour. Private sector partners, employers and enterprises, the labour movement, community groups and individuals must do our part and work closer to promote innovation and more equitable outcomes. We need a more multipolar social compact. The so social compact cannot be just between government and the people. More important is the compact among the various parts of society and an understanding of how to work together for a better society. Successful citizens should be prepared to pay the taxes necessary to sustain a society of opportunity for all. Businesses should understand that they have obligations to the societies that they operate in and put and put purpose into profit. They must help create an inclusive workforce that recognizes the dignity of labor, 
and fair wages and enable lifelong learning. A thousand points of light will take some getting used to. The government is trying to be less directive and more collaborative, less transactional and more relational. It is progressively building up these muscles. Many parts of our society are responding constructively. But it does mean more diverse views, more, more public debate, more messiness, maybe even more confusion before there is consensus or compromise. We need to be able to handle this. Messiness and uncertainty are par for the course in the world of innovation. We should all get used to it. It is a sign of a maturing society and the basis for a more durable nation. Singapore has the makings of a thousand points of light. A young former colleague of mine pointed me to American sociologist Robert Putnam's latest book, Upswing. According to Putnam, what fuels an upswing in society is a widespread moral awakening. Youths rise with a new set of ideals, leaders with a strong moral compass capitalize on this to push for reforms, businessmen look beyond profits and give back to their workers and communities, and the ordinary citizen champions a cause larger than his own. Then my colleague adds, in her own words, and let me quote her, I do believe that there are many such Singaporeans, concerned Singaporeans, quietly seeking out ways to contribute. They are the salt and light, scattered everywhere, mostly invisible, yet giving the world its flavour and its form. We have to find a way to give voice to them so that it creates a larger movement that carries us all forward. These lectures are named after our former president, S.R. Nadan. The values that guided Mr. Nadan's life are an inspiration to all of us. He rose from humble beginnings to come up in life through determination, discipline, and dedication. He put country before self. He risked his own life during the Laju hijacking incident in 1974 when he secured the release of Singaporeans held hostages. He had genuine warmth and compassion for others, especially the less fortunate in society, whom he went out of his way to help. Let us reflect on Mr. Nadan's life of integrity and purpose in the service of others. At the end of his memoirs, a signed copy of which I treasure, he says, ultimately in all the decisions I was called upon to make, my conscience was my compass, values. Let it be so for us too, in our work and in our lives. Change presents opportunity. This lecture series began with the changes coming through the four horsemen. Singapore is in a strong position to deal with these changes. But we need more innovation because we want to find better ways of solving our problems and creating opportunity. We need more inclusion because we want to benefit as many people as possible and leave no one behind. And we need more inspiration because despite all the challenges around us, there is hope in a better Singapore if we stay together and work together. Ours must not be a narrative of constraint but a narrative of confidence. Not a mindset of cynicism, but a mindset of idealism. Confidence based on strength, and idealism based on pragmatism. Let me close with some lines from two of my favorite poets, Rabindranath Tagore and Alfred Tennyson. I don't know if they are relevant to these lectures, but like all things in literature, their meaning is not in their words, but what we make of them in our minds. The first is Tagore's poem, Gitanjali, where he paints his vision for a free and cohesive India nearly 40 years before his independence. And he says, where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit, into that heaven of freedom, my father, let my country awake. The second is from Tennyson's poem, Ulysses. Talks about how after the weary 10-year Trojan War, the Greek hero Ulysses set sail with his men across the Mediterranean. And it goes like this. The lights begin to twinkle from the rocks. The long day wanes. The low moon climbs. The deep moans around with many voices. Come, my friends, it's not too late. 
to seek a newer world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me start by probably expressing the thanks of the thousands of people who've read, listened, uh, to, 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 or, or watched what you said. Um, and ask you for your own personal take on, on, on you know, this being the last lecture. Um, have you been surprised by the deluge of feedback, debate, opinions that your four lectures have sparked? <laughs> um, and, um, you know, I want to thank you. I think, you know, thank you and, 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 and IPS um, for huge amounts of, well, you've got data, you've got poetry, <laughs> a lot of new ideas, um, a lot of heart and soul into this. So thank you. And, and how has the response um, to all your lectures been? Have you been surprised? Uh, well, first, Susan, thanks for joining us. <laughs> Good to see you again. Um, I haven't been following too closely uh, some of the responses, except for many people who wrote to me. And that was uh, quite heartwarming. Uh, and, and some of them whom uh, I've not seen before, uh, offering ideas. Uh, it gives me a, a, a lot of satisfaction and hope uh, that there's been gener that discussion has been generated. Um, I should say some messages are sometimes oversimplified, um, but that's in the nature of public discourse. Um, so. That's something you know we, we just have to accept as part of the part of the landscape. But uh, it has been quite a labor of love uh, doing these four lectures. Um, I uh, fully now understand the meaning of the phrase, uh, the agony and the ecstasy. <laughs> the <laughs> agony of trying to do this. Trying to write something from to scratch. To write something from scratch yes. when I still have a full-time job, yes. uh, day job. Uh, but the ecstasy Running of... the central bank, incidentally, yes, <laughs> no incidentally, small drop. Yeah. Um, uh, but the ecstasy and the joy of uh, discovering new things and uh, uh, reflecting on issues you know, more deeply than I would have uh, on a regular basis. So altogether, it's been a good experience. Uh, I'm happy that it has generated some discussion. Um, and everything I said today about having respectful discussions, yes. uh, uh, respectful disagreements if necessary, but to do so with empathy and trying to see the other point of view. Uh, throughout my lectures, that's been one of the things I wanted to do. Um, you know, people grab the ideas, but behind the ideas, I've tried to explain the trade-offs, the tensions, there are choices. And so almost no issue is cut and dry. Yes. And if people understand that and the complexities, they become more open to seeing the other's point of view. There and are trade-offs in all choices, yes, right? Yes, there are. And ultimately, we have to make these choices, hard Indeed. as they may be. Um, since you quoted Churchill, I thought I will also quote Churchill. I think today's <laughs> inspiring nation reminds me of my own personal favorite quote of Churchill, which is that uh, you make a living by what you get but you make a life by what, what you, you give. Yeah. Um, and I think today you were really aiming high. You were, you were trying to lift the discourse to, to, to inspire us towards being that higher being, right? Uh, you know, mm. the, the, the epitome of the Maslow hierarchy of needs. So let's bring this to Singapore. I think um, there might be some paradoxes here. We're a tiny island. We've always thrived for excellence, right? Best country in the world for, uh, for doing business. Uh, most green country, best country to react to COVID, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this constant aim for excellence, because we're small, we've got to stay ahead, we've got to be innovative, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Does that jive with this broad meritocracy that you're talking about? Because I've had a lot of questions come through, um, and a lot of it really about education, which I'll dive through in a minute, but also. Um, you know, can you share, you said you, you see the education broadening out, I, I would agree. Uh, uh, you want to see the workplace also broaden out, I would agree. Do you see the public service also broadening out towards a more inclusive and a more compassionate kind of uh, meritocracy? Yes, I, I think it's happening uh, 
uh, everywhere um, may not be as dramatic or as fast as we would have liked to, uh, because it does take time getting used to. Um, it was very easy for me to say, you know, uh, don't just look at uh, resumes and interviews. You know, try to broaden the way we uh, recruit people. Um, and we've tried it. It's not that easy. <laughs> See, you can understand why organizations uh, rely a lot on uh, exam results and so on, and then have an interview. And you know, people who come from a certain socioeconomic class, who have traveled, they do very well in interviews, and personalities and so on come in. Um, but they don't give us a good sense. And at the end of the day, we're still guessing. Yeah. So this is going to be a, 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 I think, I don't have a solution, but I think this is an area where uh, every business needs to seriously think how it wants to recruit people. Yeah. And you know, you use an analogy of the relay in mm. one of your, in your first lecture, I think, you know, well, off the gun, everyone's equal. But after that, when it comes to second, third, fourth runner, depends on how fast the guy was ahead of you, right? Yep. And that reminds me of the first, second, third, fourth generation, I guess, and, and, and how much of a head start your parents gave you, your grandparents gave your parents, etc. So does that mean maybe sometimes taking a step back to take two steps forward to, to, to bring the ones behind along, um, you know, to this journey? Uh, and, and how far back do you step? Right? I've got questions here, one from Gabriel Sim, who said, at what level should broad meritocracy start? Given that PSLE starts at, is taken at 12 years old, should we scrap the PSLE completely <laughs> and <laughs> do a different kind of testing? Uh, is that too young? Um, you know, so a few questions around how we can broaden that. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, no, that was a tough, uh, you no, know. No, there are no easy, answers no easy answers because there are a fixed number of places in the schools that are most desired. There's a large number of people who want those places. When there is scarcity, how do you ration? In the marketplace, you ration by price. Yes. <laughs> those who can pay will go. Definitely, you don't want that in our education yes. system. It happens in other countries, unfortunately. We don't have that. Um, then the other one is to draw lots. Let luck, let fortune decide for us. Uh, would that be more popular with people? I'm not sure. Because that takes away the, the incentive and effort uh, to want to do well. Because end of the day, lots are going to be drawn to determine where I go. So you're stuck with still <laughs> looking at test scores and grades and so on. So I think that is probably going to be the central premise. But I think around it, and that's what some of the reforms that the Ministry of Education has done are trying to do, to soften and to temper some of the sharp edges of our meritocracy. Um, and not, not to have an over fixation with some of this. I think it would be useful if we mix different abilities a little bit more and not to be too sharply defined as we are today. Yeah. Now, you need to find a formula that does that because if you do too much, then some parents will be unhappy. Uh, if you don't do too much, then it's not going to be very different from today. And, you know, the kids grow up with uh, other kids who come from very similar backgrounds and, and so on. So we need to find a, a middle path in this. And this is something that uh, is also not um, a policy issue. I mean, at the end, you need a policy. But the policy will be guided by what people value, what people feel about this. Then we should have a discussion. You know, it's easy to say scrap something, but what would you have in its place and how will you organize things? And I think if we can get to that kind of discussion, that'll be very yeah. useful. Okay. So that's a question from former minister. Um, I guess I, I'm allowed to say his name is Sir Jacob Ibrahim. <laughs> uh, he says, thanks, Ravi, for a great lecture. Just a simple question on how to realize your inspiring vision. What would be amongst the first things you would like to see happen to realize this vision? <laughs> Probably several things need to happen. Well, I think some of that effort is already underway. Um, like I said, uh, 
The government really wants to engage, uh, be more consultative, and to get more views, have discussions, and so on. Um, I also said it is still developing those muscles. Yeah. Because um, we were not very good at it mm. in the old days. So we're getting there. Um, and also what inspired there. us in the past, you know, might be different from what Must will inspire be, yes, us right. in the future, right? And yeah. today there are different things that inspire people differently. Yeah. Um, so that's why I listed a few, a few things. Uh, giving and philanthropy, volunteering, that's one area that some people might find inspiration in. And, and active maybe citizenry. Active right? citizenry yeah. is another. Uh, the environment, doing something for sustainability, that's yeah. another. Um, taking part in civic uh, discourses and so on. Some of them are inclined. So we need to find more ways of being, bringing people into uh, civic discourse. Uh, but there will be it, it, it will be different areas that appeal to different people. Yeah. Um, and we need to set up the frameworks for doing that. And I think we also need to do this in a way so that it does not look overly orchestrated by the government. <laughs> that this so is truly a partnership, a yeah. right? And again, I think to be fair, the experience varies. Uh, there are some initiatives where, you know, it's private and public sector together, um, but the government does seventy percent of the work has pretty much. <laughs> decided what it wants, but wants some, you know, to embellishment and enhancements and a reality check. Um, I think that model is shifting towards one where actually why not the private sector take the lead in some of these things? Yes. And the government just sits behind and says, okay, um, some broad parameters, broad principles that we would like to see. Um, and we were just talking earlier on about uh, what we did in the financial sector. Yes. And there have been several instances, the, yes. Uh, p the, the private, private banking, banking industry, industry group. group. Yes. So the MAS said, look, we need to do something about reducing the risk of money laundering. Um, and and raising the standards of the practitioners. And gi giving standards yeah. for practitioners. Yeah. But look, we are not private bankers. We just know what we want to achieve. These are the broad outcomes. Can you all figure it out yes. and develop your own standards, your own code of conduct, your own uh, methods of doing this and your own method of how you will comply with the requirements and you guys did great you did great you well, chat that group thank you i think it was a <laughs> bunch of competitors in the room you yes. know threshing out our differences arriving at the common point of what we wanted to achieve for the industry for singapore yeah uh, hammering out you know the execution path and then off we went and i yeah. think you know the results have have Spoken for itself. For itself. Yeah. It is good, yeah. Right? Because it is industry created. Yes. That's why it works. Ground up. Yeah. Ground up. So a new way to looking at this sort of PPP partnership, right? Yes. And um, allowing and active participation from the private sector. And shaping outcomes. Yes. And if the government is very clear about what the broad outcomes are and the broad principles, and if there are OB markers, what they are, then to let the process take shape on, take its, shape own. on its own. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Let's talk about the beacon of uh, diversity, Ravi. Um, and, you know, totally empathize with putting yourself in other people's shoes. But social media is a double-edged sword, right? In your data dilemma uh, pros, uh, you know, I think uh, we all aware that algorithms have a funny way of reinforcing your own proclivities and creating perhaps exacerbating this great big divide between right and left or, or whatever it is your, your, your political proclivities or personal proclivities may be. Um, how do we compensate for this? Can we? Well, um, this is, is a tough, tough problem. Uh, many countries are facing it. Um, I would start with Um, finding ways to reduce the spread of falsehoods. That must be, you know, even yeah. before we get to the point of, you know, reading multiple perspectives, even before that, at least even the one perspective that you're always reading, your echo chamber, to make sure that what you read there... So fact-checker of sorts. Yes. Yeah. So 
my vision for the internet of the future is that everything that is put in, there is a simple requirement, and I don't know who will set it, how that will come about. Maybe have a blockchain of uh, verification. Verif and, okay, yeah. but that would be very expensive. <laughs> yeah. But uh, an automatic fact check of yeah. everything you read, yes. from whichever source it comes. There are algorithms, I mean, there are fact checkers today. Yes. There are algorithms that do it quite well. If we can make that algorithm permanent, fixed feature in everything we read on social media, um, then at least we can separate fact from fiction um, and stop uh, amplifying falsehoods. The part about how do you expose people to different perspectives is more challenging because people have a right to read what they want to read. Mm -hmm. um, so another thing, and I'm just thinking out of the box here, is that when you read a, a point of view and then there's a fact check that says, okay, this is factual, then something else pops up to say, there is, however, a different point of view. And then you could click on that. Now again, I'm sure the, the, the techies will be able to write programs and algorithms to make this happen. Yes. The question is, but that becomes then an, uh, an intrusion um, into you know, my reading pleasure. But today we but already are well being be, disturbed by advertisements. advertisements. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Right? Right? You're listening so. to something and an advertisement pops up. Why can't something pop up that says, uh, there is, however, a different point of view from what you've been just hearing? And maybe you'll click that and listen. That might well work. I don't know, but uh, these, <laughs> this trying, is a big problem. Right? Yeah, it's We've worth got to trying. Get creative around this. Yes. So, an interesting uh, question here about cultivating values from Mr. E.K. Tan. Uh, whilst uh, you know we have had these values demonstrated now during COVID, uh, can we be more systematic in cultivating these values in our citizens rather than leaving it to chance? So it's interesting. I was just thinking about this because you know, as I said, you are aiming high. You are. Uh, appealing, appealing to our, our higher instincts, um, but you know, human beings were not, you know, we're all born different, and sometimes, you know, we, we can be a bit lazy, or we might, you know, litter or or speed, <laughs> take the easy way out. Um, countries, I mean, we, we, I like to joke that Singapore is a fine city, right? We get fined for everything, for doing bad things. Uh, and today, social media, in a way, plays that role to stop people from bad behaviour. Uh, some countries have millions of cameras for surveillance to stop bad behaviour. Uh, but how do you cultivate these values more actively, other than rely on OB markers or cameras or, you know, rules? Practice. Practice. Practice makes perfect. I think it was Aristotle who said this more than 2,000 years ago. The way to build virtue is to practice it. That you become just by doing just acts. That you become brave by doing brave acts. You become temperate by doing temperate acts. And I guess if pockets of people start doing that, and that gets noticed, then maybe it will take shape. And I think it is true. You, you do derive happiness uh, by helping other people mm -hmm. become happy, happier. Yeah. Um, and the notion of gratefulness and humility uh, are indeed you know, uh, important ones. Um, let's now move to the city of giving. Um, and um, here I have a question from, um, let me see. Uh, N.V. Prasad and Chua Siu Boon. Um, oh, sorry, that wasn't uh, the, 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 the giving one. Sorry, this is a question from Gabriel Sin. Uh, for many countries with active charitable nonprofit sectors, uh, compassion goes hand in hand with the desire to change. In line with our vision to become a city of giving, do you agree that increasing our openness to advocacy could help increase our inclination to give? There are, there are already many advocacy groups in yeah, Singapore, actually, and we hear yeah. of them. And they, uh, and um, I think in the environmental movement, they are quite vocal, and uh, they have been able to uh, get their point of view across. So I think again, um, you know, if you look back ten or fifteen years, it's come quite a long way. The scene of advocacy groups are quite active, and. Uh, 
government makes it uh, a, an important priority to engage them actively. Now, of course, it's a very wide... And to harness that energy, right? Sorry? And to harness that energy. And to harness their energy, that comes their from their ideas, advocacy, and, yeah, into greater and to good. involve them uh, yeah. early on. Yep. Uh, can we do better? Of course we can do better. Like I said, the muscles are like half developed now. <laughs> so Practice. Practice. It gets better. Yes. And uh, I think it's also important for advocacy groups to understand that there are multiple priorities on any given equa equation. Um, because advocacy groups are built primarily around a cause that they are passionate about and which, of course, we all agree is important. Um, but there are also other causes and other considerations. And um, I think the education that's required is two-way for government to be more comfortable dealing with some of this uh, differences and diversities, and also for these advocacy groups to understand that there are others, other considerations, which is why I also said the social compact should not become one between the government and the people. It should be become it should become among among the people, among the people, yeah. and the government is just one player among them. Maybe a, a pretty important one, an arbiter perhaps, yeah. but there are different advocacy groups, and they also do have differences. So I think, uh, again, if you have respectful discussions and then you understand that there Still are with differences and then your empathy. We're getting there. <laughs> um, a question from uh, Mr. Zainal Abidin Rashid, um, former SMS, um, on your thousand points of light, multiculturalism. Um, his question is, with the recent show of a uh, few examples of racism, how do you see our multiculturalism continue to play a role to allow this thousand nights to shine? Yeah, so... Um COVID, uh, you know, uh, has brought out some of the best in us, and I mentioned quite a number of examples. It's also brought out some of the worst in us, and I think the stresses and tensions um, the have been played out. And, mental fatigue. Mental yeah. fatigue have played out uh, in, in this area. Um, but we also know that on uh, race and religion, um, there have always been issues. Um, but the situation here, again, you've got it in perspective, is so much better, that we've got it so much better than in most other countries you can think of, or most other societies. Um, because I think we've, all the communities have worked very hard at it, and because we know what's at stake. Um, but there will always be some who feel differently, and I think some of what has happened may not entirely be a bad thing because I think it has brought into the open the consciousness that there are some things we need to talk about. Um, I think Minister Lawrence Wong's speech uh, on the subject is probably one of the most insightful in the several decades where he actually explains that we, it goes back to empathy again that um, that it is not easy to be a minority, right? Even if all the rules are fair, inherently it is more difficult to be a minority. And that's something the majority sometimes doesn't appreciate. You should also appreciate that the majority has made substantial adjustments to accommodate multiracialism. Right? It could be, I mean, we left, we separated because of that issue, because we wanted to be multiracial. And it meant actually giving up some of what the majority could have had, right? And so that's something that the minorities should better understand. So again, it comes to empathy that both sides uh, have given something. And if both sides understand this, then I think there's greater scope for, for true harmony. Both sides need to better understand yes. and play their parts. And play their part, yeah. yes. Let's uh, move on to the love for the environment because I, I, I feel like we should give this some time and I don't have a lot of time left. Um, and uh, uh, we've talked a lot about 
uh, you know, creating a greener city. Uh, I think there was a question also about the part, the path of the individual versus the collective. Um, but my question is, you know, I think that we, 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 we've started on this path. There's no turning back, and. Um, it's quite easy for corporates or, 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 or leadership to say, look, uh, we want to set a net zero target by 2030, 2040, 2050. But it's the getting there, the glide path, the different yeah. glide paths, the individual industry best practice, the different measurements of uh, verification, transparency, transactions, um, and frankly, building the capability um, to do so. Um, and, and what is the role of the government there? So maybe share a little bit um, you know, in the time we have left, on, on how do you see that playing out? Yeah. This is going to be one of the most challenging tasks ahead. This is major restructuring of entire economies and societies. How, they, how economies function, how business models are going to work, how societies function, and how people are going to live their lives. This is going to be big. Because if you really think about net zero, it means for every ton of CO2 you put out, you have to take back. back. Um, it's no easy goal given where we are. So I think uh, this is going to be the biggest change since the Industrial Revolution, maybe even bigger than the Industrial Revolution. Well. So you're right that this has now come upon us like a sudden realization, not that we didn't know for 20 years, 30 years, people have been warning, but now it's like hit us all so in the face. Look at the flooding and the heat yes, waves. Yes, we can see, see it yeah. happening and people have woken up and now we're all rushing. There is a lot of work to be done and a lot of capabilities that need to be built up, oh, a lot so. of data that needs to be collected, a lot of data that needs to be measured, um, a lot of technology that needs to be applied. Um, a lot of skills that people need to have in doing these, these, this kind of work. Uh, and how are you going to make these transitions? Um, in my first lecture, I think I mentioned the Ruhr Industrial Region in Germany, how they moved out of coal mining. It was a 20-year process yeah. because you don't want to dislocate whole communities like what happened in the Appalachians in America. Mm -hmm. So it takes time, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of planning. This is going to occupy a big part of everyone's time, businesses, governments, you know, uh, and everything else. Um, one of the uh, problems is that it's much easier to set long-term targets. So I think there are more than 100 countries that have set uh, net zero in 2050. Yes. Um, Singapore is set as soon as possible after 2050. It's the way Singapore does things, because you've got to work out a trajectory. Yes. I'm surprised at the number of, I'm impressed and heartened when I see so many corporations and companies declare net zero 2050 targets. But I also wonder, have they really worked out how they're going to get there? And, you know, the devil's in the detail Details, and, yes. and it's a scope. One, two and three emissions, yes. how do you measure? Exactly. You... I think a... the hard work has, has begun, it's going to be enormous, yes. but it's upon us and we've got to do it. <laughs> I, I, I have two minutes and so I'm going to ask the last question, Ravi, and thank you again for your time. And this is, you know, it's about creative, I guess creative destruction. Creativity and innovation will result in a less orderly society. This is from Trois Yubun and Envy Prasad. Um, and um, do you think, you know, the government is, is, is prepared for this, you know, this creative destruction, I guess, and how prepared do you think we as individuals are for this here? Good question. And the short answer is it varies across people and it varies within government. I think within government there are uh, those who are prepared for a bit more fluidity and messiness and see that as part of the organic process. Uh, for others who don't, uh, because our stability is quite a tenuous one, and if things go wrong, you may not be able to put it back together again. So, you know, I think those, and it also reflects, you know, um, much of the government is a microcosm of public views. The public's own capacity for messiness varies a lot, right? Um, so Airbnb, 
right? Um, some of them said, let's promote innovation, let's, you know, use our, uh, let this happen, let's not restrict this too much. And others say, I don't want strangers walking through and my, house, yeah. my, my uh, estate or, or my, uh, my complex. So the people are also quite different. So it's a bit unfair. <laughs> I'm not defending the government. But it's a bit unfair to ask the government, are you prepared for messiness? Actually, the government's response is, are you? Yeah. Are you all prepared for messiness? If we are all, then let's go for it. The thing is, we are not. Yeah. Um, there are parts of the public that value that uh, uh, deep predictability, uh, things are structured. And the stability. And the stability yes. and so on. Yeah. And they value it. And they're not wrong to value it because it has gotten us so far. Um, well, I guess what we've done in sandboxing, sandboxes, yes. experimentation, we can't not innovate or try. That's right. You know? yes. So let's do it in a sandbox, see if it works, if it does, go then for it. Then you extend it, it right? yeah. Or yeah. tweak it. Yeah. yeah. So I guess, well, um, I've run out of time. But I, 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 I think I speak for everyone. Thank you, Ravi, for, for, for yeah. the four or five horsemen. It's been a wonderful journey that we've, we've, we've ridden with you. <laughs> um, and we've learned a lot. So thank you for your gracious sharing. Thank you. We have come to the end of Mr. Ravi Menon's lecture series, The Singapore Synthesis. I thank him for delivering what can only be described as a tour de force. Few in our history would have delivered so distinguished a series of lectures. Ravi sought to demonstrate how Singapore's approach will come under pressure from tectonic shifts in the world, what he telegraphed as the four horsemen, demographics, inequality, technology, and climate change. In response to these shifts, Ravi highlighted the need for more innovation, inclusion, and inspiration in Singapore's economy and society in order to secure our future. He reminded us in his final lecture that it is values that underpins everything else. I thank everyone who has been involved in making this semester's SR Nathan lecture series a success, including each of Ravi's moderators, Professor Danny Kwa, Chen Kai Fong, Ms. Chua Mui Hong, and finally, Ms. Tan Su Shen, and of course, Ravi himself. Our next SR Nathan Fellows are Mr. Patrick Daniel, the former Editor-in-Chief of the English, Malay and Tamil Media in SPH, who will deliver his lectures at the end of this year. And Dr. Nolene Hazer, the former Undersecretary General of the United Nations and Executive Secretary of the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia in the Pacific, or ESCAP, who will deliver her lectures in the first quarter of 2022. Till then, Good evening, and thank you all for attending the lectures of the ninth SR Nathan Fellow for the study of Singapore. We've come to the end of our lecture today. We would like to hear our views on the event. Please scan the QR code on the screen or click the link in the Facebook comment box to submit your feedback. Thank you all for attending this afternoon's lecture. Have a good evening.